just wanted to let you all know we are recording today and we're planning to put this on line in both English and Spanish and so um, we have that happening but we're only going to be recording the main presentation and not the breakout rooms so um, thank you again for joining us. My name is Coral Abbott. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the program manager for the Community Resilience Centers program at the California Strategic Growth Council. Um, thank you so much for joining us all for our first guideline development workshop on our round one draft guidelines. We know it's a very busy time of year, so thank you for being here. Um, before we get started, we're pleased to offer Spanish translation for today's workshop. If you would like to access the Spanish translation, um, the instructions are on our next slide. Perfect. Thank you so much to Lydia and Fabiola, our translators, um, who are translating now in the Spanish channel. So maybe we can pause here for a moment to make sure that folks are able to read this slide. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so here's our plan for our roughly two hours that we have together today. Again, we're recording this workshop with the intent to post publicly on our YouTube channel, um, but are not recording the breakout room discussions. However, we do have a number of colleagues here supporting on note taking to make sure that the feedback you give us is still captured. Next slide, please. So here are our objectives for today's workshops. Um, while we'll take time to give an overview of the current draft, we are holding most of the time today to hear from you all and hope that you'll share your thoughts and feedback with us on the draft that we've put out publicly. Um, and we'll mention this again at the end, but our public comment period is open from now until January 27th, and we encourage you to send any additional thoughts you have after today's workshop. Um, so with that, I will pause and invite the rest of the CRC team to introduce themselves, starting with Jess McCool. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you all for joining. My name is Jess McCool. I use she, she her pronouns, and I'm calling in from Shumash Land in Santa Barbara. Pass it to Jessica. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us well. My name is Jessica Cervantes. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a CRC program associate joining virtually from Tongva land, also called East Los Angeles, California, and I'll pass it over to Dora. Good morning, everyone. This is Dora Monterosa. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a CRC program analyst joining virtually from Miwok land, also called Sacramento, California. And with that, I'll hand it to Lisa. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. I'm Lisa Hu. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a program analyst joining virtually from Ohlone land, also called Oakland, California. So I'll present the next section. Next slide, please. Wonderful. So we likely have a mixture of folks that are familiar with our program already and perhaps some folks that are a bit newer as well. So just to frame our workshop today, we're going to briefly summarize the program his, uh, background, starting with the legislative history. So as, far to, as part of California's uh, state climate budget last year, Community Resilience Centers was established by SB 155 to provide funding for the construction or retrofit of facilities to serve as community resilience centers that mitigate the public health impacts of extreme heat and other emergency situations exacerbated by climate change. These include wildfire, power outages, flooding, and many more. The statute includes specific functions for resilience centers, including hydration stations, cooling centers, clean air centers, respite centers, and community evacuation and emergency response centers. SB 155 went on to specify that the program should not only include the physical infrastructure elements needed to serve as these emergency response facilities during climate or other disasters, but also as spaces to build long-term resilience. It specifies that CRCs should focus on an integrated delivery of services as part of their function. 
Uh, the enabling legislation also discusses multi-stakeholder partnerships to ensure that community-based organizations and local residents are represented in the governance and decision-making processes for resilience centers. Um, so we'll talk about more of that in the presentation itself. Finally, SB 155 also calls for SGC, that's us, to go through a public process for developing the guidelines to allow for transparency and robust stakeholder feedback. So thank you for joining us. Next slide, please. So during the close of this past legislative session, the governor approved, signed, and chaptered additional legislation impacting our program. AB 211 codifies our program and offers this additional direction one, to prioritize projects located in and benefiting under-resourced communities, which is a specific definition that Jess will cover. Two, to prioritize projects representing statewide geographic diversity. And three, to specify the number of years a recipient must offer CRC services and programs. We'll cover this in the rest of the presentation. Importantly, this legislation also discusses our reporting to the legislature and authorizes advance payment. Next slide, please. So through the initial budget allocation and the additional funds or program received through AB 197, the Budget Act of 2022, we are pleased to have these updated numbers. So now we have $110 million total for round one and $160 million total for round two. These are from the state's general fund and these include funds for both planning and implementation, both of which we will discuss today. Next slide, please. So here's our proposed funding breakdown for round one of our program. So of the $110 million available for round one, we propose 100 million available for grant funds and 10 million for program administration and support. So on the grant fund side, this breaks down to $95 million total in round one for implementation grants, each of which can range from five to $10 million. That shakes out to about 10 to 19 implementation grants estimated in round one. The 5 million total then for round one for planning grants, each of which can range 200K to 500K. That is our estimate for 10 to 25 planning grants in round one. So in total, assuming those ranges, we anticipate funding about 20 to 44 projects in round one, but we also look forward to hearing input on these proposed award ranges. On the program admin and support side, that $10 million includes program administration and staffing costs for the entirety of the program, as well as technical assistance, which we will discuss, and program evaluation. Next slide, please. So with the official CRC program launch in just July of this year, staff committed to a robust stakeholder engagement process to develop the round one draft guidelines, which we released earlier this month. We hosted a kickoff webinar with many attendees that was recorded, posted, and also translated into Spanish. We hosted five listening sessions, um, and through those five listening sessions alone, received approximately 1,030 comments from stakeholders. Staff have also presented at various forums, met regularly with stakeholders directly, and also conducted key informant interviews to specifically research rural resilience um, needs for our program. So from all of that input, we developed and released our round one draft guidelines. Um, so thank you everybody who has already participated in building this program. Next slide, please. From our previous public engagement, these are five major themes that we heard. One, to ensure that site selection and physical facility features meet actual local community identified priorities. Two, to embed and integrate the social infrastructure and programming also focused on local community identified priorities. Three, to provide robust and tailored technical assistance to individual communities, thinking across many different phases from application, implementation, to evaluation. Four, to plan for long-term financial sustainability of each CRC. And five, to offer as much flexibility as possible in our funding guidelines. So we've, we're have we developing the engagement summary. We'll have more information about that shortly, but this is at least what we heard already in those listening sessions. Next slide, please. 
So from all of that input, here is our non-exhaustive list of elements that we've already incorporated into our draft guidelines from what we've already heard from stakeholders. And again, thank you so much to everyone who has already weighed in. We really appreciate it. We could not build this program without you. So this includes one, um, providing broad eligibility for applicant types and facility types, just given the range of communities across the state. Two, we're not requiring match or leveraged funding. We do talk about obviously financial sustainability, but we're not having that as a requirement. Three, we're allowing tribes to use the indirect cost rate negotiated with the federal government. Four, allowing CEQA clearance by the end of year one. Five, including pre-development and basic infrastructure costs in implementation grants. Six, ensuring 24 seven access to CRC facilities. And of course, thanks to AB 211, our program can now offer advance payment. We will note, however, that our enabling advance pay authority limits our program to ad offering advance payment only to projects where the lead is a community-based organization. So we can talk about more of that in the grant room. So with that, happy to hand off to Jess to share the CRC program over you. Over to you, Jess. Thank you. All right, so let's get into the CRC program overview. Thank you, Lisa. Um, given that background, here is how staff are proposing to design the Community Resilience Centers program. So I'll start with an overview of the entire program, and then we'll zoom in on implementation grants, then planning grants, and then zooming back out to invite clarifying questions before we move into breakout room discussions. Um, all right. So our overall approach is pulled from a combination of requirements from statute, priorities we heard during initial listening sessions, stakeholder interviews and meetings, and advice from folks with experiencing developing resilient centers or hubs. Um, so here's a quick overview. Build climate resilience and community resilience. Prioritize community serving locations. Require community engagement and collaborative stakeholder structure balance shorter term and longer term needs, both during emergencies and year round programming to build community resilience, Prior prioritize the most vulnerable. Um, so the language you use in draft guidelines is priority communities, access and functional needs communities and other vulnerable residents. Um, so the access and functional needs or AFN communities is an expansive definition from California Governor's Office of Emergency Services which helps our program with alignment on emergency related guidance and activities. Um, so this definition includes individuals who are or have physical, developmental or intellectual disabilities, chronic conditions or injuries, limited English proficiency, older adults, children, low income, unhoused and or transportation disadvantaged or public transit dependent and pregnant people. And then lastly, funding and mix of projects. So in terms of climate impacts, facility types and lead applicants, and geographic diversity spanning rural and urban communities, as well as incorporated and unincorporated communities. Next slide, please. All right, thank you. So to operate, operationalize this approach, uh, core components for our program include the following, many of which come directly from statute. So a multi-stakeholder partnerships, which per statute must include local residents and community-based organization in governance and decision-making. This can be part of the collaborative stakeholder structure or as an additive. Um, we adapted this component from SGC's Transformative Climate Communities Program and the Regional Climates Collaboratives Program um, for folks familiar with those two SGC programs. Um, next, a robust, meaningful, and culturally appropriate community engagement throughout all phases. So in the design, application, implementation, and evaluation. Um, this is defined a little further in Appendix C of our draft guidelines. Uh, capital projects. This is our umbrella term referring to the physical infrastructure investments to the CRC facility itself and CRC campus amenities like a bus stop or community garden. And lastly, community resilience services and programs. Um, again, this is a term that we use for the social infrastructure investments and services and programs to ensure the ongoing year round usage of the CRC while strengthening local community resilience. Next slide, please. All right, so we are proposing to ensure all communities are eligible to apply and are directed per statute to prioritize projects located in and benefiting under resourced communities, a set definition in state code. 
For any folks familiar with SGC's Regional Climate Collaborators Program, this is the same definition from that program. Um, so the map pictured here highlights all under-resourced communities in blue. Uh, we will include this in forthcoming materials on our webpage as well. Our plan here is to build on statute a bit further to conduct targeted outreach to and to prioritize under-resourced communities for technical assistance. Uh, we added language to make that very clear, make it very clear that tribal lands, unincorporated communities, and rural communities that meet the definition of under-resourced communities qualify as priority communities for the CRC program. All applicants must discuss if and how their proposal considers, involves impacts and benefits priority communities. All right, next slide, please. So we intend to fund at least two tribally led CRC projects in round one across both the planning and implementation grants. This essentially functions as a tribal set in set aside and refers to projects where the lead applicant is a California Native American tribe or other related entity. All right, with that, I will pass it to Coral and Dora to discuss our implementation grants. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jess. Um, so yes, we will now cover the implementation grants portion of the guidelines. Um, we propose five overall program objectives for the implementation grants. These are to offer multi-benefit physical community serving spaces that are resilient to both current and future climate hazards, to provide integrated delivery of essential services and programming to support local communities, both during disasters, emergencies, and disruption events, and to address ongoing community needs and build community cohesion. Um, also to integrate physical infrastructure projects with social infrastructure through community-driven partnerships and programming to increase climate resilience, expand economic opportunities, and reduce health, environmental, and social inequities across California. Then to leverage and build a skilled, diversified, and trained workforce, promote local workforce development and training opportunities with a focus on preparing community members for high quality career pathway jobs in a net zero carbon economy that are resilient to current and future climate change impacts. And finally, to build, strengthen, and sustain local leadership and grassroots engagement in civic and community development and climate resilience awareness and activities. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so based on the variety of communities and stakeholder input, um, we're keeping eligible applicants and eligible facility types very expansive. Our goal is to be less prescriptive and more flexible to acknowledge different needs in different communities. For the project area eligibility, we're requiring that capital projects are on the same parcel or adjoining parcel as the Resilience Center um, or within a one mile radius of the Resilience Center along a walkable route. We're also requiring the project area be a contiguous area included within a planning area in local or regional planning documents or a transit service area. Next slide, please. So we're proposing seven strategies and we're requiring implementation grant applicants to select at least four for their proposal. The draft includes examples under each strategy that demonstrate how each one can include both physical infrastructure and social infrastructure activities. What we're wanting to do here is model a comprehensive approach to climate resilience and community resilience. We're wanting to encourage projects that take a holistic approach to addressing resilience, as opposed to projects that focus solely on one climate impact or one technology or one dimension of resilience. So the first strategy is energy resilience. Examples might be energy efficiency and electrical upgrades, 
solar PV and microgrids, backup power, um, and then on the social infrastructure side, enrollment into weatherization and low income energy assistance programs. Then for water resilience, examples might be water efficient infrastructure and appliances, um, water well filtering, or um, printed materials on water conservation and drought resistance. For air quality and public health, examples might be um, upgraded filtration or purification systems, um, extreme heat related measures like reflective and cool surfaces, um, indoor and outdoor air monitors, COVID precautions, heat related programming and monitoring, things of that nature. Then nature-based solutions and food security. This might be urban greening, um, land acquisition for defensible space if you're in a wildfire prone area, community gardens, food preparation, processing, refrigeration, storage, distribution, um, cooking classes and wildfire management trainings. So a very expansive category. Then emergency preparedness and critical communications. This might be seismic retrofits to the building, um, critical communications during emergencies, resource distribution, and then in language materials on climate events and emergencies and evacuation processes. Um, for mobility and access, this might be something like adding a bus stop at the site of the center, mobile units and shuttles for access and functional needs communities, um, an EV car share, transit services and programs such as paratransit and van pools. And then finally, workforce development, education and training. Um, so this could be actual physical classrooms and workforce training program spaces in the building, um, computer labs, but then also GED and community health worker certification programs, small business incubation, um, and programs that develop local grassroots leadership. Next slide, please. So to dive more into eligible activities, we have broken these into capital projects, which include the CRC facility or the building itself and campus amenities, which are those um, elements that are on site at the center, but not a part of the physical building. So something like a community garden or shade trees. And these are all the physical infrastructure pieces. And then community resilience services and programs, which are services or programs that are directly connected to and based out of the Resilience Center. We, take, we detail a long list of example eligible activities in Appendix D of our draft guidelines. These are just examples, it's not a complete list. Um, and then in the appendix, you will see that the services and programs are broken down into the following broad categories that are on this slide. Health and well-being, emergency preparedness and response, access and mobility, information distribution, housing affordability and protection, and workforce development. Next slide, please. We split the eligible costs into very broad categories with minimums and maximums set to ensure that the majority of funds go towards building out physical projects. So direct implementation is the first category these are costs directly related to implementing the project, like construction costs or staffing. Um, within that, we have the capital projects or physical infrastructure. Um, we have proposed that at least 65% of the award has to go towards the capital projects. We're also allowing that 10% of the total award go to pre-development costs and 10% of the total award um, be eligible to be used for basic infrastructure such as water or wastewater connections. So an example would be you have 10% to pre-development costs, 10% to basic infrastructure costs, the remaining 45% spent on the capital projects, direct implementation costs unrelated to those two pieces. Then we're proposing that community resilience services and programs can be up to 20% of the total award 
and that community engagement can be up to 10%, although allowing requests to be made to go above this with strong justification. An important note of clarification here is that services and programs may include their own engagement as part of that program. So for example, if the grant was funding a community health worker program that includes as part of that program budget staff going door to door to share information about resources at the Resilience Center, that would not contribute to the 10% cap. The 10% cap is about engagement on the overall project. And then indirect costs, we're allowing up to 12% is what's proposed, but with the exception for federally recognized tribes who have an indirect cost rate they've negotiated with the federal government, we're proposing they can use that indirect cost rate. And then finally, data collection and indicator tracking, we're asking that applicants set aside 3 to 5% of their budget um, to ensure that they can cover costs of data collection. Next slide, please. And then finally, a few important notes on the ineligible costs list is that we're unable to use program funds to pay for fossil fuel powered appliances and infrastructure, like diesel generators or gas powered appliances. Another note that you can't use CRC funds to supplant other committed funds for any part of the proposal, including services and programs. Um, and then while many engagement related costs like food, childcare, and transportation are eligible, we can't pay for the following outreach costs, direct cash benefits, subsidies, or participant incentives. And then we can't pay for projects without long-term operations and maintenance plans. And with that, I will hand it back over to Dora to cover some of the project requirements. Thank you, Coral. So to give a bit of background here, the CRC facility requirements are mostly drawn from statute, from guidance received from the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, and from review by Cal OES, also known as the Office of Emergency Services. The CRC draft guidelines propose that all CRC facilities must be able to serve the following required functions by the end of the implementation grant award term. They must be able to be activated 24 seven in an emergency. They must be accessible and offer community resilient services and programs year round to residents. This one is a direct quote from our statutes. They must contain the necessary infrastructure to be used as all of the following. Heating centers, cooling centers, clean air centers, hydration stations, weather respite centers, community evacuation and emergency response centers. Next slide, please. The draft guidelines also propose requiring CRCs to have the following features by the completion of the project. This is the standard, standard requirements for most new buildings, including ADA compliance, an air filtration system, and outlets for people to charge their phones and other personal communication devices. Uh, we will also require features more unique to being used for climate and other emergencies, including backup power source, backup water source, backup broadband access, shelters, so places for people to sleep during times of emergency, and ability to co-shelter pets, space for food preparation and storage, refrigeration for storing food and medicines, showers, and laundry. Uh, we also strongly encourage, actually back one more slide, sorry, Blanca. We strongly encourage applicants to consider optional features that encourage social cohesion, service delivery, and disaster preparedness, such as conference rooms, uh, like community activity rooms and classrooms, child care spaces, computer labs, medical facilities and resources, outdoor spaces that can be used to conduct programming, produce food, and implement nature-based solutions such as groundwater recapture. Next slide, please. Required provisions of service and use as a community resilience center um, is the draft guidelines do require a facility to be used as a community resilience center for a minimum of 30 years following the completion of the funded project. Draft guidelines propose that CRCs provide a minimum of 10 years of community resilience service and programs. 
And we are required to set this as a minimum number of years for services per the Assembly Bill 211. We do, however, invite suggestions and are open to examples and ideas on how to enforce this. Next slide, please. Um, upon, let's see, the draft guidelines propose requiring draft plans upon full application to, could be, to be completed during the grant term. CRC emergency plans must include a mobility plan to transport vulnerable residents, an emergency communications plan, a plan to work with relevant emergency responders and direct services orgs, agreements in place to support activation of the center in case of an emergency, as well as processes, sorry, processes that include the roles and responsibilities of different organizations in activation. All plans should consider and integrate into plans how they will serve vulnerable community members, including access and functional needs communities. The year-round community resilience plan is another aspect um, that is also required. There must be a draft outlining proposed partners, strategies, and activities to ensure CRCs are functioning as community service, serving locations, and utilized year-round. Likely components here would include services and programs, community events and trainings, and other related activities to ensure that the CRC facility functions as a community serving location. I will now hand it back to Coral for our next section on program thresholds. Wonderful, thank you, Dora. So listed here are the five components of the Resilience Center program thresholds. We're proposing a community engagement plan as a threshold requirement, as well as requiring the collaborative stakeholder structure to be finalized by the time of application via a signed partnership agreement or memorandum of understanding. We're also detailing our site readiness requirements Projects do not have to be fully shovel ready by time of application. Um, so for example, if CEQA is required as a process, you have the first year of the grant term to complete and get CEQA clearance. Um, the readiness requirements are really centered around ensuring there's a high likelihood that the proposed project can be built within the grant term with the proposed budget provided by the applicant. Some important notes are that applicants have to be able to demonstrate site control, have to be able to demonstrate that the project is financially feasible, and have to provide an operations and maintenance plan demonstrating how the facility and services and programs will continue beyond the grant term. Applicants must also be able to demonstrate that the Resilience Center will be able to be used for 30 years. Next slide, please. So to summarize, here is what we propose requiring for implementation grants. Applicants will need to select at least four strategies and associated activities to meet the program objectives. Um, those are energy resilience, water resilience, air quality and public health, nature-based solutions and food security, emergency preparedness and critical communications, mobility and access, and workforce development. Um, and then applicants will also need to meet all five program thresholds that I just covered upon full application submission. And then finally, they need to ensure that the site and the overall project can meet the project requirements by the end of the implementation grant term. Those include the facility functions, the facility features, services and usage, and the emergency plan and year round community resilience plan. Our intent with this approach is to allow communities as much flexibility as possible in a state infrastructure program to identify the specific priorities, strategies, and activities that will best meet their needs under this program. Next slide, please. So we propose a two-phase application process, starting with a very simple pre-proposal. At the pre-proposal phase, we will not provide applicants with a score, but instead provide feedback on the likelihood of readiness for round one, including recommending that applicants apply for planning grants if they're unlikely to be ready for round one implementation grants. We'll also assign technical assistance following the pre-proposal phase 
based on the capacity of the team that's applying, as well as the priority community criteria. Next slide, please. Beyond the baseline requirements, here are our current proposed scoring criteria and the broad breakdowns of points. So first, vision and objectives, wanting to see how the strategies and selected activities will help to meet the program objectives. Next, community profile and engagement plan, wanting to get a clear description of community, the engagement that's been done to date, and the proposed plan to continue engagement under the grant term. This portion should especially focus on improved outcomes, outreach, and engagement for priority communities, access and functional needs communities, and other vulnerable residents. And then capacity and partnerships. This is ensuring that the lead applicant has the financial and organizational capacity to manage the grant and that the collaborative stakeholder structure is strong and equitable. In this portion, we've proposed awarding additional points to projects with a tribal lead applicant. The next category is project impact. It's the largest category of points. This will look at demonstrated need or value of the proposed strategies and activities, including demonstration of building climate resilience and community resilience through anticipated project benefits and outcomes. Applicants will need to show how they're responding to current and future climate risks and how they've designed the project to mitigate against the impact of climate risks or impacts that they're vulnerable to. So for example, clearing defensible space if they're in a wildfire prone area or building above grade if they're in a floodplain. Additional points are proposed here for projects located in and benefiting under resourced communities, as well as additional points to under resourced communities that also are unincorporated and rural. We also want to see a clear comprehensive work plan that meets program objectives, builds climate and community resilience, and meaningfully prepares the community to implement a future CRC. And then also want to see that the draft emergency plan and year round community resilience plan show an ability to serve communities during emergencies and year round. And then project feasibility, wanting to see that the project design is feasible, clear, relevant and appropriate, that it bridges physical infrastructure and social infrastructure, that it it shows an ability to meet site readiness requirements and project requirements by the stated deadlines. And then demonstration, importantly, that there will be financial sustainability of the Community Resilience Center, including operations and maintenance costs and services and programs. And finally, the sharing plan, which is just wanting to see how applicants view their proposal as one that might be able to be replicated by other similar communities. Next section. Next slide, please. So finally, the grant administration section provides some information on what to expect once a grant is provided. We anticipate having four-year project completion periods followed by a one-year performance period. This expedited timeline is because the funding came to us in the state budget with a requirement for funds to be expended fully within this time frame. SGC will enter into a contractual agreement with the lead applicant of each awarded proposal, and that lead applicant will need to work with subgrantees to pay them for their work on the grant. As mentioned earlier, um, AB 211 gave SGC advance pay authority. The legislation did limit the entities who can receive advance pay to community-based private nonprofit agencies and additionally detailed that we may only advance up to 25 percent of the award. Our ability to provide advance pay will also end on June 30th, 2025. Again, these are all set in place by the legislature and we don't have an ability to change this guidance and the guidelines. And finally, applicants will need to provide progress reports to SGC 
as well as work with a third party evaluator to collect and report out data on project progress. As mentioned earlier, we're going to be asking grantees to set aside a small portion of funds to allow for data collection and indicator tracking on the grant. With that, I will hand it off to Jess to cover the planning grants. Thank you, Coral. All right, so now let's discuss the planning grants. Next slide, please. Thank you. Here are the proposed program objectives for the planning grants. Advance the local community's ability to identify, vision, design, construct, resource, and activate sites as community resilience centers. Ensure or increase accessibility of community resilience centers to community members, especially during emergencies. These activities can include, but are not limited to, AB 2645 planning and implementation, targeted outreach and planning for access and functional needs communities, mobile units and services, and or development of evacuation, transportation, mass sheltering, mass feeding plans, and networks. Build, strengthen, and sustain local community resilience in connection with a proposed CRC. These activities can include advancing local workforce development and training opportunities for a future net zero carbon economy, supporting local leadership and grassroots engagement in civic and community development, and climate resilience awareness and activities. And lastly, demonstrate consistency with the state's planning priorities contained in section 65041.1 of the government code. Uh, so these priorities intend to promote equity, strengthen the economy, protect the environment, and promote public health and safety in the state, including urban, suburban, and rural communities. Next slide, please. There is broad eligibility for applicants and facility types for the planning grants. A collaborative stakeholder structure is required by the end of the grant term, and applicants must have a planning area and site identified within that planning area. Eligible planning activities include preparing applicants for a CRC implementation grant, identifying and preparing project sites, includes CEQA, audits, site assessments, engineering and design elements, complete fiscal analyses and studies, building capacity, evaluating, updating, streamlining policies and codes, preparing or updating local jurisdictional plans, example, the general plan safety element, and lastly, designing community engagement plan and or strategies. Next slide, please. So with this first phase, we are offering an optional technical assistance intake survey. The goal here is to get initial concept and ideas, types of TA needs so we can review and match, ideally with the TA provider on board. Again, this step is optional and folks can still apply without this step. Then there is the full application process, including narrative, work plan, community engagement plan, budget, and documentation on the applicant's capacity. Uh, the threshold review is much sim simpler and focuses primarily on the eligibility. Uh, we plan to offer application TA, but not implement implementation TA. And the CRC planning grants will have a grant term of two years with an option to extend on a case-by-case -case basis. Next slide, please. All right, so overall scoring is out of 100 points. The vision and objectives being 15, community profile and engagement plan at 25, Lead applicant capacity is 15. Um, we will be providing additional points to projects with a tribal lead applicant. Um, additional points awarded to projects where the lead applicant is a California Native American tribe, an eligible entity having co-ownership with a California Native American tribe, or an eligible entity established by a California Native American tribe to undertake climate resilient projects. 
Um, then the project impact, 40 points, uh, additional points here to proposals with projects located in and benefiting under resourced communities. Additional points to proposals from any of the following priority communities that meet the definition of under resourced community, unincorporated communities, and rural communities. And additional points to proposals demonstrating the ability to directly meet readiness requirements to apply for CRC round two implementation grants. And then lastly, the sharing plan five points. So I will now hand it off to Jessica to cover next steps before we take a general Q&A. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jess. So as you mentioned, we'll be covering next steps for the CRC program. Um, as mentioned, staff released the round one draft guidelines for public comment earlier this month. In the meantime, Elements, our team is working on include ongoing coordination with other SGC OPR programs, technical requirements for specific elements, such as microgrids that have additional regulatory and readiness requirements, advanced payment, technical assistance and program evaluation. Next slide, slide, please. So here's our freshly updated program timeline. So um, our draft guidelines were released by SGC on December 7th, which will be open for public comment through January 27, 2023. And now through March 2023, the CRC team will incorporate input from public comment meetings with subject matter experts and stakeholders, and our interagency work group. Our plan is to bring the final guidelines to council for adoption in late April, followed by release of the Notice of Funding Availability, NOFA, and applications in late spring 2023. We currently plan to have the application window open for two to three months, but we would love any feedback on this application window from you all. And by summer 2023, we anticipate SGC making round one awards. And next slide, please. So again, as mentioned earlier, this is very important. So the guidelines have been released for, um, draft guidelines have been released for public comment through January 27 at 5 p.m. Pacific time. You can provide co public comment by emailing the CRC team at crc at sgc.cal.com. Gov, and by participating in our workshop breakout groups, which we'll be going over a little bit later. We welcome robust input from you all to ensure the program meets actual community needs. Um, and next slide, please. So as mentioned earlier, um, during this public comment window, staff will host seven virtual workshops, including this statewide workshop, which we are recording and will post to SGC's YouTube channel. And throughout the month of January, we will host regional workshops along with workshops for California tribes and rural California communities, which are listed on the screen now, um, but we can follow up with more information on that. Um, during these workshops, we will provide a similar overview of the draft guidelines we did earlier and facilitate the breakout groups for discussion inputs. And regional workshops will also include an optional networking session after the presentation and breakout room discussions. And now I will hand it over back to Coral and Lisa, who will be facilitating our Q&A session. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, team. Um, so with that, I think Lisa has been monitoring some of the questions in the chat. Um, so Lisa, if you could share any of the questions that we might want to answer publicly before we move into breakout rooms, would love that. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for chiming in with questions. We know we're covering a lot of content. The goal is to try and explain as much of the program as early on so we can get the um, the robust input. So thank you for participating. So one thing um, we did get asked is maybe, Coral, if you can clarify again which communities are eligible versus which are priority communities. And can you also answer, does the CRC have to function as all of the roles or can they function as a subset of the roles? Yes, absolutely. So to answer that first question, all communities in the state are eligible to apply. That includes communities on tribal lands as well. Um, priority communities are set by legislation as under-resourced communities. Um, those include three different definitions to qualify as an under-resourced community. We can definitely share that map. I noticed a question in the chat 
we're going to be working with our GIS analysts likely to make sure we have an updated version of that map. Um, and we'll do what we can to kind of figure out how to help folks identify whether or not their project lands in a priority area. If in the meantime you are kind of wanting a, a sooner answer, please feel free to email us an exact site location at crc at sgc.ca.gov and we'll see if we might be able to help you with that now. Um, and then can you remind me of the second question, Lisa? So Absolutely. Sorry. The question was about, does a CRC have to function as all of the roles that Dora presented or a subset of the roles? Yes, so at present in the draft, it is all of the roles. Um, however, that is one of the things that we are very much hoping to get your feedback on. We did have a discussion with our council on it last week, and I think there are varied opinions. Um, this language and those functions did come from statute, but we're figuring out what flexibility we have to have certain functions, but not all. And so I think that is an area we're really going to focus on for the final guidelines and encourage and welcome input on that section. Wonderful. All right, we've gotten a couple questions about both for the implementation grants and also for the planning grants. Can a single award include more than one site? Great. So for implementation grants, based on our legal counsel's interpretation of the statute and this being kind of the first round, the um, Resilience Center applications can only include one site as the Resilience Center as a physical facility, so a single kind of building, campus, parcel area. Um, but for planning grants, um, as long as the site has been identified ahead of time, um, the planning grants can focus more expansively on a number of sites um, and preparing them for application um, to the program. Wonderful. So we have a question about, does the community engagement plan have to be site specific or can it incorporate plan elements from local authorities? Yes, so I think it's absolutely welcome to um, include previous engagement that's been done that's relevant to the site, but given how specific these projects are intended to be to serve the community in that specific neighborhood, um, we do think it would create a much stronger application to be able to do neighborhood specific site specific community engagement to demonstrate how the site was selected, what elements are being included or services and programs, and how that's responding to community needs that have been identified. And then just a quick plug, one of our breakout rooms that we're about to move into in a moment will focus specifically on that topic. So if you have other thoughts or feedback on community engagement in particular, that is a great room um, to offer more input as well. We got another question, Coral. Um, can you say more about the operations and maintenance plan? How does an applicant demonstrate that's been satisfied? Can funds be used to develop one? Hmm. Can you say that one more time? The audio cut out for me for a second. Sure. So the question is about the operations and maintenance plan, and maybe I can help on this one. I think it'll, we'll have a slightly different answer, I think, for the implementation grants versus the planning grants. For planning grants, our intention is for as many activities as possible to be funded under the planning grant term itself. Um, and one of the many kind of buckets that just mentioned does include, um, you know, all of the different elements like fiscal analyses, audits, developing plans to ensure um, that that projects are able to advance and ideally projects are able to um, apply for future implementation funding. I think on the implementation side, this is an element that we would love to hear robust input from you all today on. So my breakout room actually will be covering scoring criteria and will be a space for folks to offer suggestions on a lot of different elements, including that one. But yeah, feel free to add to that, Coral. No, I think that was great. I think that is something we're very open to. and don't feel a need to necessarily be prescriptive about how folks are demonstrating 
um, their ability to keep the building um, operational over a longer time period, um, but just want to see kind of some form of demonstration that the center will be able to be open and used by the community well beyond the grant term. Wonderful. Yes, as you can tell, we are still thinking through a lot of these questions in real time. So we are coming to you all nice and early. So please give us input. Um, all right, so we're at 11.02. So maybe we can take two more quick questions um, that I'll bounce to you, Coral, and then we can start moving into breakouts if that's okay. So the two questions that I'll offer are one, can you apply for both an implementation and a planning grant? And the second question is, do you envision CRCs to function as earthquake emergency evacuation centers? 